Welcome everyone to the Canadian Nurses Association's webinar series, Progress and Practice. This webinar is about deprescribing for older, older adults, the keys to success. This session is being recorded for nurses who are unable to participate today. My name is Aidan Hamza and I'm the acting lead for policy and government relations at the Canadian Nurses Association and I will be hosting this webinar. At the end of this presentation, we'll answer your questions, which you can type into the Q&A box that you see to the right of the slide. We'll address as many questions as time allows. The certificate of participation will be emailed to you along with the link to the recording of this webinar. And now a little bit about our presenter, Winnie Sun. Winnie Sun previously held the postdoctoral fellowship at AgeWell, Canada's technology and aging network. In 2014, she received her Doctor of Philosophy in Nursing Science from the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. An expert in gerontology and community health nursing, Dr. Sun is currently an assistant professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the, Auto, at the Ontario Tech University, where she focuses her research on deprescribing medications, particularly among older adults, whom she is passionate about helping them live in, independently at home for as long as possible. Over to you, Winnie. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Aiden, for your introduction. And just to give you an overview of the learning objectives for today, and I'm going to de develop um, a way to, to a customer approach that nurses can reduce polypharmacy and to implement evidence-based deprescribing. So that is the, the first objective. And my, my other objectives today is also to share some tools and resources that's available for nurses to support evidence-based deprescribing in both the inpatient and outpatient settings. And the most importantly, is to focus on the use of effective communication techniques that you can engage with the patients and family members and healthcare providers in the deprescribing process. So I would like to say that I do not have any actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. Next slide. So, I would just like to talk about a little bit background about why deprescribing is needed. And the first one we need to talk about is, is medication use good or bad? So in terms of good, the benefits, medication can provide symptoms management. It treats multiple chronic conditions to reduce comorbidities, it can help reduce the potential of mortality when used correctly and also can meet patient expectations regarding their treatment goals and therapy, and oftentimes can make the prescriber feel like they're helping the patients because they are providing some type of pharmacological treatments to the patient. Next slide. So what are, what are the issues then? And what triggers the need for the higher medication utilization? And what is the problem with polypharmacy? And polypharmacies is the combination of the medications that it does more harm than good. And we know that from the scientific research, the more medication we take, the more likely that we're going to experience drug interactions, risk for falls and fractures, memory problems, hospitalization because of medication harms, increased life expectancy, and in like expectancies is mean, meaning that there will be more chronic diseases and particularly among older adults. So there would be more use of preventative therapy in chronic disease management. And also for the fact that there are many patients who are actually self-medicating using over-the-counter medications for symptoms management. And the use of increasing number of complementary therapy alternative medications, and those are available for health maintenance reasons or for alternative measures. Next slide. So as we age, what are the complications? At the physiological level, these are the age-related physiological changes as we age. And that as we age older, our kidney and liver are less efficient at processing the medications and also to remove them from our bodies. And also this means medications can accumulate in our bodies 
and can cause more side effects. Our brain can become more sensitive to drug effects, and that can cause confusion in older adults, dizziness, memory problem, driving issues, or fatigue. As we age, our body also contains less water, and that means the medications can become more concentrated. Medications can also stay longer in our body because we have less muscle and the less muscle mass and also more body fat. So to summarize all of these effects, as we go grow older, the harms of medications can become more pronounced. Next slide. So what, how, like how many medications and what percentage of community dwelling older adults actually take? So I want you to ponder upon these questions. So what percentage of older adults living in the community, age 65 and older, take five or more different prescribed medications? So the answer to this is there are two thirds of the Canadian older adults age 65 and older take at least five different prescribed medications. And don't forget that we are including the over the counter medications here. And the second question is the percentage of older adults living in the community who takes 10 or more different prescribed medications. So there are actually one quarter of the Canadians takes at least 10 different prescribed medications. And the last question here asks, what about people who are age, old, the older age of 85 and older? And what percentage of them actually take 10 or more medications? So the, the answer to this is actually 38% of them actually takes 10 or more medications. And you know that as we get older, they tend to take more medications. And that could be problematic because of the, you know, the, the physiological changes that we talk about, and that could cause a lot of the problems, side effects and drug-to-drug -drug interactions, and also some, some of the unwanted adverse effects that might affect the body, that we don't want that. And that could cause more harm than good. So that's why we have to talk about the prescribing. Next slide. So these are some of the examples of the top 10 medication classes among seniors in Canada, which they use very often. And the first one is the, H, the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. And that is the cholesterol medications, retro medications that older adults often use. And followed by, proton pump inhibitors, which is the treatment of stomach acid, um, heartburn, GERD symptoms, and followed by ACE inhibitors, which is a type of high blood pressure medications for also for heart failure. And then you also see some other medications, beta blocker, which is a type of blood pressure medications. And then there's also antihypertensive medications from dihydropyrin, Herbidine, and then you can also see some um, angiotensin. There are a, quite a few of blood pressure medications on this list here, which I'm sure that you're not surprised. Next slide. So four to five medication is the threshold that linked to an increased risk of harm. And it makes sense that it doesn't make sense that we only target the number of medications because research study found that if we intervene, we actually ended up adding more medications to the patients. And if you see the graph here, looking at the number of medications, based on the longitudinal study of 1,705 men living in the community, age 70 and 97, the highest risk of, the, of harm that's experienced by the older adults, it's frailty. So frailty is the state of health when the person's overall, overall well-being and ability to function independently are reduced. And the person will become more vulnerable to health deterioration 
and the risk of becoming frail increases with age. Next slide. So which drug we are most to blame? And I wanted to talk about some of the medications that is high risk. And those are the drugs that oftentimes will cause hospitalizations and ER, ER visits. This one. So these are the examples of medications that's responsible for the ER visits that oftentimes will result in hospitalizations. And as you can see on in this list here, the Joxin is the most high risk medication for older adults in particular, because this study, it was studied among the older adults age 65 and older, and there were 37% of which require hospitalization because of the use of these medications. So the Joxin, high risk medication. And you can see from the rest of the list, um, many of them could be a um, warfarin, which is, you know, anticoagulant. There's also some other types of um, hypoglycemic medication that's also problematic here, some diuretics. And the BEERS criteria talks about some of the potentially inappropriate medications. That's also in the, you know, in the list as well. Next slide. So the top five drug classes, now, 88% of the drug-related hospitalizations, then that's associated with bleeding risk. When, and I was already talked about warfarin is on that list that we previously shown as one of the problematic medications that result in ER visits and hospitalization. So warfarin and also um, some anticoagulants and NSAIDs. Now NSAIDs, remember, ASA, which is, you know, the, the aspirin that we oftentimes we use also in that list, which is oftentimes associated with the increased bleeding risk. And it results in the 88% of drug-related hospitalizations. And the other risk harm that's associated with that is hypoglycemic risk, used because resulting from the use of insulin, oral hypoglycemic reagents, and cardiovascular agents like digoxins and diuretics and beta blockers. And also something that we haven't talked about is the central nervous system agents, such as the use of benzodiazepines, opioids and antipsychotics, and sometimes the use of antibiotics. So these are some of the um, CNS agents that can oftentimes increase the risk of falls and also impair judgment. Next slide. And I, in the previous slide that I show you about the, the, some of the medications that cause ER visits and hospitalizations, the AGS, beers, guidelines, and criteria, those are the medications that are potentially inappropriate. And that was identified by the American Geriatric Society. And these are some of the med uh, examples of the medications. So the reason why these guidelines were developed was they wanted to show that some of these potentially inappropriate medications could have more risk than benefit. And when there are more risk than benefit, alternative therapies must be explored. And that's why deprescribing must come into play. And I talked about some of the side effects of some of these medications could be risk for falls resulting from benzodiazepines, antipsychotics, some of the sedatives, and antidepressants. And these are some of the examples of the potentially inappropriate medications that we have to pay attention to. And that we can, it, when it comes to the prescribing, those are the, the, the riskier medications that we have to focus on. Next slide. In terms of the frequency of the beers criteria drugs used in Canadian seniors, so this is an example of one example. And as you can see in the graph here, there's the men and the woman. And you can see that woman is significantly at higher risk of being inappropriately prescribed medications. And particularly, 
the medication, the one medications that were inappropriately de uh, prescribed for women is the lorazepam. Lorazepam, if you look at the percentage of inappropriately prescribed medication for women, it's 11%. And that lorazepam is the number one problem for inappropriately de uh, pre prescription. And as, for, as opposed to men, for 6%, which is significantly less, less, uh, less risk of being inappropriately prescribed. So we have to look, really look at the women's, it's really at greater risk of experiencing medication adverse events because oftentimes they are being inappropriately prescribed medications. The other, some of the risk for women at having greater risk of medication adverse events are because of their longer life expectancy because they also suffer more chronic conditions because of the longer life expectancy, and also for the fact that they more medications, and also for the fact that female biology and physiological changes also increases that risk of harmful effects of medication. Slide. And this is the slide that summarizes what I said about how women at, at a greater risk of having medication adverse events because of some of the physiological differences and also for the fact that because they have longer life expectancies and the need for managing uh, chronic conditions and comorbidities. Slide. So what is the treatment for polypharmacy and inappropriate medications for older men and women? Slide. We are really talking about medication stewardship, and it is not also known as deprescribing. And I'm going to talk about what deprescribing is all about. So deprescribing is part of the solution to the problem of overmedication and the use of risky medication. We can deprescribe medications that may cause more harm than good. And deprescribing is really talking about reducing or stopping medications that may be not beneficial or may be causing harm. And the goal of the prescribing is to maintain or improve the quality of life of patients. When patients are prescribed a medication, there should be a plan or monitoring to know that the medication should be re-evaluated to see if that could, should be reduced or stopped. And we also believe that the prescribing should be patient-centered and also require interprofessional team approach. The prescribing must always be done within a team where doctors, nurses, pharmacists, they're all involved for input and consultation. And this is why we have in Canada set up the Canadian Deprescribing Network to help support the healthcare professionals in their learning for this prescribing. Next slide. So these are the steps to deprescribe. And the first step is really to identify those potentially inappropriate medications. And those potentially inappropriate medications could be coming from the American Geriatric Society's Beers Guideline. And we have to determine if the dosage can be reduced or maybe the medications needs to be stopped because it already achieved the therapeutic effects or it is no longer needed. We also need to engage the patient and caregivers in the process because this is a shared decision-making process and that must be patient-centered. And oftentimes we might want to start the conversations. Why, why are you taking this medication? What are the potential benefits and harms of this medication? And can that affect your memory, risk for falls, can this medication stop or reduce the dosage? And what follow-up do I have to do? So really develop a plan for tapering or withdrawal steps in collaboration with healthcare professionals, such as doctors, pharmacists, and then schedule that follow-up. The follow-up is important to monitor any side effects of withdrawal symptoms, for example. You have to monitor for and document any adverse withdrawal symptoms and also the outcomes. Are we achieving the outcomes that we want? 
and to support the patient in this process. It's very, really important. Supporting the patients in this process is the key to successful deprescribing. Next slide. So evidence of benefit and the risk of harm and the duration of treatment. These are some of the elements that we focus on when we talk about deprescribing. So how do we identify which drugs to deprescribe? And this is a common question from nurses. And we talk about in the previous slides that based on the explicit criteria, such as the beer criteria, what are some of the medications where deprescribing is needed? It's when the medication harm is greater than the benefits. So we have to look at those consensus lists of drugs to avoid, such as those potentially inappropriate medications. Also, is there a lack of evidence to continue a medication? Remember that the prescribing is an evidence-based approach. So based on the indication, why the purpose of having this medication and the duration, how long has the patient already been on this medication? And look at any evidence or any, any, any indication for discontinue or continue on as needed. And also looking at the medication, is it providing no or little benefits? If, there is if the medication is providing no or little benefits, can there be other alternatives that we can consider? And you would also want to look at moderate to high probability of harm. Because when we talk about medication optimization, it is really about the patient's safety. Is the patient having the risk being minimized? So risk management and patient safety is important. Also explore any drug-to-drug -drug interactions. And the other thing that's important to talk about is pre prescribing cascade. Prescribing cascade is when the situation where the first medication administered to the patient actually causes the adverse event. And that was interpreted as a new condition. Therefore, the prescriber would prescribe a new medications for the patient. And that's when the cascade go on and on. So for example, a prescription of a proton pump inhibitor can reduce GI adverse events, events associated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the NSAIDs. So that's an example of a prescribing cascade because of the GI um, side effects or symptoms because, and that is due to the prescription of a proton pump inhibitor, you actually add another medication on top of this with the NSAIDs in order to treat that side effects of the medication. And that's when the polypharmacy go on and on. And you also want to look at availability of safer drug or non-drug alternatives, which may be better options. And also look at non-adherence, poor tolerance of the medications, and also the cost may be too expensive and that's why the patients are not adhering to the medications. Also, you want to explore the patients and caregiver requests for deprescribing. Sometimes the patients and the caregivers, they, they are ready to deprescribe. They, want, they wanted to try something different than pharmacological measures. Next slide. So when are the, the points where the prescribing is very important, especially during transition of care, because this is a very vulnerable situation where when the in individual come from one facility to another. And that's where the prescribing is an opportunity for the prescribing and also a vulnerable situation where polypharmacy will occur because of the previous medications list going to a new facility and that there's, there's no follow through to see, oh, is there multiple medications that is redundant? Another situation is when the patient is moving to long-term care facility. Also, when the patient is relocating from the hospital to home for discharge. 
<clears throat> also, when there is change in goals of care, so we wanted to evaluate, is this medication still the focus of the treatment for the patient? Also, looking at the changes of the physiological state, is there any reduction of the renal functioning that would, that would actually require the reduction or this discontinuation of the medication? And also with the renewal of the medication, ask, ask yourself and the patients, do the patient really need this renewal of medications? Am I doing this because of the, the practice, the habits, or do the patient actually require this for therapeutic need? Also, is a new symptom possibly caused by the medication? Because the patient may be experiencing side effects and that, that side effects may be misinterpreted as a new condition that, is, that, that, is, that needs treatment. So looking at any type of side effects that might be experiencing because of the medications. And making this as part of the routine. Engaging in regular medication review, medication reconciliation process to identify any medications that need deeper, deeper sweating. Next slide. So which medications increase the risk for falls? So these are the examples of the potentially inappropriate medications that would increase the risk for falls. And here are some of the examples such as diuretics and benzo, antipsychotic, anti antidepressants. But among those, you can see polypharmacy increases that risk for 75%. So the more medications the patients take, the more risk that they would experience the risk of falls and probably increase their risk for hospitalizations and emergency room visits. And which is why this is important to always think about the opportunity for the prescribing whenever possible. Slide. So what are the tools to help nurses to think about the prescribing process. And these are some of the examples of the tools, such as Empower brochures, medication stopper, the prescribing algorithm, and also my Sleep Well website that I'm going to just talk briefly about that so that you can know that these are some of the examples of the prescribing tools to support you in this process. Next slide. So, Medication Stopper is an online tool to help stop medications for your patient, and is specifically developed for clinicians. And this deprescribing aid can allow you to create a medication list and suggest which medications need to be stopped first and advise the safest way to do so. And then you can decide what should be tapered and stopped. Next slide. So this is just another screenshot of the medication stopper, showing that sometimes, you know, which medications should be the ones that do not need and taper off, no longer needed. And because, you know, the patient's already experiencing withdrawal symptoms and that the, the, the discontinuing process and the tapering off process should be slow. So it really helped the, the clinicians to make a schedule for tapering. Slide. So tapering and stopping, this is very important because the tapering for medication is, it has to be slow. It, it cannot be rushed because of the risk of withdrawal symptoms that the patients may experience and you may be doing more harm than good if with the process is not done inappropriately. So for example, make a schedule for those medications that really need to be tapered off, such as those beta blockers, benzo, uh, pro propontum inhibitors, diuretics, narcotics, anti-confusion medications. So all of these are the ones that are high-risk medications that really needs to have a proper tapering schedules so that the 
to minimize the risk of the patients in experiencing withdrawal symptoms. And how do we do that? Is to follow an evidence-based algorithm. And I'm gonna show you an example of a deprescribing algorithm that we can use. Slide. So this is an example of an evidence-based deprescribing algorithm. So oftentimes prescriber will say, oh, it's difficult to stop medications when the prescribing guidelines only talk about starting them and not stopping them. So the deprescribing guidelines were developed as an evidence-based approach to help support clinicians in safely stopping or reducing the medication. We use this evidence-based approach and develop some de de prescribing guidelines for at least three specific drug classes, pro proton prom inhibitors, benzodiazepine, and also antipsychotics. And there are some other medications that were also developed in terms of the prescribing um, algorithm. So this is just an example of this um, evidence-based de de prescribing algorithm that you can use in order to follow how do you decide when, when to deprescribe and what is the process? What is the tapering schedule? So it, it's really user-friendly and it's available in the deprescribing.org our website that you can uh, follow up after this presentation to find out more about this. Slide. So, Engaging patients, what does the research tell, evidence tell us about patients not wanting to taper benzos? So here is an evidence-based research studies that I wanna share with you. Empower, eliminating medications through patient ownership of end results. So there were 30 community pharmacies around Montreal and a total of 303 participants, benzo users for three months, age 65 years of age and older. They have no dementia, no, not on antipsychotics. So there were wait list control of 155 participants and the intervention group, 148 participants. They were randomized. And then the result is that with the intervention group, there were 27% of complete discontinuation of the medication as opposed to the 5% complete discontinuation of the medication. And that is over the six month follow-up period using the EMPOWER brochure. And the EMPOWER randomized trial is really testing this patient educational tool with the goal of empowering older adults to act as the drivers for, safe, for safer prescribing practices. And these brochures really recommend the effective therapeutic substitutes to medication and a stepwise tapering protocol. So it's, it's a really effective patient educational tool to help with the deprescribing process. Next slide. And you can see that this is a, a final result showing the prevalence difference that for N for four for complete discontinuation versus three for discontinuation or dose reduction. And re it really confirms how the effective use of the Empower brochure in educating the older adults in, in, in supporting them in the prescribing process. So the Empower brochures, these are some of the examples of the prescribing brochure that's available on the, the prescribing network.ca. And the brochure really talks about, for example, sedative, hypnotic use. That's leading, leading to an increase in self-reported knowledge and drug-related risk perceptions, and also an increase in the discussion with the physicians and the pharmacists about the information, discontinuation of benzodiazepine among those chronic users of inappropriate benzodiazepines. Next slide. So this is an example of a tapering off program that's included in the Empower brochure. So it really shows step-by-step step of how 
a benzodiazepam could be safely tapered off. And that for the old practice of reducing 25% every two weeks, it's way too fast. And the fact that we always have to prepare the patient for withdrawal symptoms. And if we think that there will be no withdrawal symptoms, and, and this is really not realistic. So we always have to prepare that there will be some withdrawal symptoms and that we know that there should be a plan to support patients through the process so that they will be persistent in the, the prescribing approach. So talk to, for example, Mrs. H about the prescribing of her medication such as sleeping pill. And that is very commonly used among older adults. And we talked about this before, where women were inappropriately prescribed with lorazepam before, right? So next slide. And there are different ways to start this conversation. There is the direct deprescribing method. For example, I see that you are taking a lot of pills, but wouldn't it be great if we could get you off some of those medications? And interestingly enough, Direct the prescribing medication could work because there is 71% of Canadian seniors that are actually willing to stop a medication if the doctor says that's possible. And that's quite a bit of seniors who are willing to engage in the prescribing if they were say that, yeah, it's safe to do so. That's also another method is the indirect method. And the nurse, nurses may say to the patient, so how was your sleep? There's some new research about sleeping pills that I would like to discuss with you and that we can talk to the doctor about it. So it's an indirect way of saying, okay, how is your sleep? And there might be some other alternatives that I learned about, about um, not, you know, non-pharmacological measures that might work better than the use of sleeping pills. Another way is the emotional assertive method. So about your memory problem, your faults, I'm really worried that the medications that you're using might be contributing to those adverse events, right? So this is a where, where the nurses become emotional and concerned about the situation and saying, okay, you know, you are experiencing some, some adverse events and that is not good because I am worried that those are the medication side effects that you are experiencing. So this is in, when we talk about the prescribing, it is important where that we use cognitive dissonance to elicit the, the prescribing conversation. So what am I talking about cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance is where a situation where there are conflicting attitudes, beliefs, or behavior, and that produce a feeling of mental discomfort, and which would lead to an alteration of your attitudes, your behaviors, or your beliefs, in order to reduce your discomfort, and then restore that sense of balance. So in this situation here, so are you a poor sleeper? Oh yes, just terrible, I need my sleeping pills. Really? So how many times do you wake up at night? At least three to four times? Oh my, so I guess the sleeping pills are not working then. And then the patient's like, huh? So there is like light bulb suddenly just glow. And it's like, okay, I've been, I've been taking sleeping pills, but it is really not working. So why am I taking the sleeping pills? So that is the conflicting behavior that I'm talking about. And that's where the cognitive dissonance come into play, where through the conversation you, between you and the patient, that could create this mental awareness leading to behavioral change. And I really like this quote from the Caden Nursing Leaders. It says, so when the patients ask, why do I have to take so many medications? Nurses shouldn't say just, oh, because the doctor prescribed them to you, but that we should be proactively and say, maybe you actually don't need those medications. Let's take a closer look at that together. 
and we can work as a team to see if there's anything that we could deprescribe them. So this is important that we have to talk about some of the benefits of deprescribing. The benefits of deprescribing could be you might experience less you know, risk for falls, hospitalization, less risk of adverse drug events, drug interactions, and also we could simplify the patient's medication regimen, improving their drug adherence, improving their cognition, and reducing societal costs, healthcare costs, or patients' costs for themselves in terms of financial implications of the medications. Next slide. And when we talk about the prescribing, it's very common that we will talk, have these conversations in palliative care setting. And I really like this approach of FRAME. So FRAME is an acronym, acronym for leading that prescribing conversation. What you need to do is, first of all, you need, whenever you talk about the prescribing, you must have a trust and developing that rapport with the patient. The patient has to trust you first. They have to have this trusting relationship in order for them to have that buying in for the prescribing. And also, patient, you have to identify the patient's readiness and the barriers to the prescribing. And if the patient is not really ready at that point, then maybe the next day you talk about that or the day after. So patient's readiness, assessing patient readiness is important. Also aligning the deprescribing recommendations with the goals of care. And that has to be patient-centered care. So what is the patient's uh, goal in terms of their palliative care goals, for example? You also have to manage the cognitive dissonance that I talked about before in order to elicit the buying in from the family members and the patient and also to empower the patients and the family members to continue the deprescribing conversation, really to educate them for increased understanding of what this is all about. Next slide. So now let's talk about what are the alternatives. So if we want to stop or discontinue a medication, what are some of the alternatives? And there are many, many of those non-drug therapy out there that we have to consider. This is an interesting slide that it says, I'm going to prescribe this because I don't have time to explain why all you really need is fresh air. So this is really talking about, the, you know, the, there is not the need for pharmacological measures in many of the management of chronic diseases. So put a safer place in terms of the use of other safer alternatives. And this is an example of the safer alternatives such as cognitive behavioral therapy to treat chronic insomnia. And this is some of these suggestions that you can make to the patients in place of the use of lorazepam or sleeping pills. For example, a better sleep hygiene schedule avoid uh, taking you know, ca caffeinated um, beverages and don't exercise before bedtime, relaxation techniques, and also having a realistic expectations about sleeping schedule. And sleep restriction, you know, just having the sleep during the nighttime, not during the afternoon, but now could, because that could really affect your sleeping schedule. Reducing stimulus control, and so the key thing is maximizing your sleeping efficiency. When we talk about sleeping efficiency, we're talking about the time at sleep and over the total time in bed. And we want to maximize that sleep efficiency. Next slide. So this is a sleep diary that could actually help patients to monitor their sleep efficiency. And this sleep diary is included in the Empower brochure that you can look into. And that could be very beneficial for your patients if patients are having uh, insomnia issues. So 
This is an, an other resource that you can refer to your patients for cognitive behavioral therapy. And there is a cognitive behavioral therapy brochure and also an app that you can look into and that you can also refer your patients to learn more about this. There is also group coaching um, you know, as part of the, you know, the resources. And if needed, you can always refer to a specialist who is specialized in cognitive behavioral therapy. And cognitive behavioral therapy is one evidence-based approach that could really increase and increase and better promote a patient's sleep hygiene and is an excellent evidence-based non-pharmacological measures over the use of sleeping pills. And there are some other examples of non-drug therapy, such as compression stockings for the leg edema, avoiding eating too much before bedtime so that you don't have to use proton pump inhibitors, and doing pelvic floor exercises, avoiding caffeine so that you, you're not going to experience incontinence, eating apples and with the skin on instead of using stool softener, and walking, exercising, and also eliminating any triggers for patients with dementia instead, instead of using antipsychotic medications. Eliminating triggers such as, you know, um, using uh, reminiscence therapy as one of the non-farm measures over the use of antipsychotic, for example. Using creams or gels instead of using soap so that you don't have to use antihistamine for your skin. And also look at you know, your, the blood sugar targets for frail elderly in order to reduce the insulin use and anti-diabetic anti medications. So these are some of the effective ways of non-farm measures that we can consider as we are engaged in the deep prescribing process. So whose responsibility to deep prescribe? Next slide. So in oftentimes that one of the biggest barriers to the prescribing is the blaming game. So we blame that the doctor prescribed too much or we blame that the specialty prescribed too much. So, it, and this blaming game is really not helping with the medication optimization for the patient. So we, we need to realize that, you know, as soon as, palliative care patients, for example. Usually, the prescribing occurs during the last week of their life. But then we have to you know, change that perspective and say, okay, maybe that should occur prior to that, prior to, to those last week of life, or maybe in, in the last three months or six months, depending on the patient's goals. So this is ultimately, we have to realize that patient-centered care is our goal. And and also interprofessional collaboration is the key. So teamwork requires effective communication. And there is study in the literature saying that nurses believe that communication with the doctor for the, for the effective deprescribing is the key for them. So in order to have effective um, deprescribing, there should be effective teamwork, and that comes from an open communication. So this is just an example of how this the prescribing teamwork actually looks like in clinical practice. So it could be first nurses would monitor the patient during the, the prescribing process for any type of withdrawal symptoms. And then they might consider to put actually put the non-drug therapy in place. And then the physiotherapist may come in and say, okay, I'm going to help Mrs. X to, to, you know, to engage in pelvic floor exercises in order to reduce that risk of incontinence and help them with exercising or, or prevention of risk for falls. Social worker may come in and help with the anxiety of experiencing incontinence or depression and also to uh, help with any sleeping, you know, any, any isolation that's uh, you know, originating from depression and sleep, and a poor sleep hygiene. Occupational therapists may come and say, okay, Mrs. X may, may require the mo mobility aids 
such as a walker to safely walk from the bed to the washroom. Dietitian may come in and say, okay, there might be dietary approaches in order to treat um, the GERD symptoms and weight loss if, if that's, that's problematic. And psychologists may also conduct cognitive behavioral therapy sessions in order to treat symptoms of insomnia and also you know, reduction of anxiety. And the pharmacist would, would come and say, okay, let's identify any other drug-related problems. Let's develop a plan for medication changes and to taper off those medications as needed. So you can see that this is really, the prescribing is really a team approach. And, and this is a really good quote that I love. The view of the prescribing acts as an act creates fear of negative outcomes. Most healthcare providers do not view on the continual or the renewal of an existing prescription as an intentional act that can also have serious side effects. So healthcare providers, oftentimes they see that the prescribing creates that sense of fear and that they, they feel uncomfortable because, oh, you know, what if they experience uh, you know, side effects and withdrawal symptoms? And, and what, what, what are we gonna do about that? And it's that sense of fear that healthcare providers experience. But then at the same time, healthcare providers also need to see that what are those, what about those side effects that we are we are actually putting the patients at risk for? Risk for falls, for example, at risk for hospitalizations or any type of other serious medication side effects that we are putting the patient in harm more than benefit. Next slide. So what works? And these are the, the steps that would work in a deprescribing approach. Structural medication reviews, and oftentimes in nursing, we would do medication reconciliation. And medication reconciliation process, sometimes it's oftentimes it's only done at admission, but then it should be done on an ongoing process in order to monitor any type of medications that might need the prescribing. So ongoing medic structure medication review, planning for any rebound of symptoms or withdrawal. So sometimes we have to realize that the prescribing is not a one stop. It's, it's a continuation that we have to monitor for ongoing symptoms and withdrawal. And sometimes patient may have to go back to having the medications as needed. So it's, it's a it's continual process. It's not a one stop approach. Communicating with community providers as needed. So again, this open communication and education. Education is so important. Patients, when they are educated about the need for the prescribing, they are more likely to, to have that buying in of, of accepting or you know, embracing the, the importance and the benefits of the prescribing. So using tools such as Empower brochure, we know that these and power brochures actually worked and they are effective because they are evidence-based. Hi, Dr. Sun, we just have uh, about seven minutes left. Um, so I'm not sure, just to, to give you a heads up. Sure, thank you. I can quickly just finish this off. And I think this is just kind of some of the summary of what I just talked about before. Next slide. Now, medication management during COVID-19, and I wanted to talk about this because, because of the pandemic, things have changed and things could, be, things could be challenging. So there is actually a guide developed by um, University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, and please check this out. It really talks about medications that could be discontinued and change, and how that should be approached during um, time of crisis and challenging time. Um, because particularly during the pandemic, patients need more support uh, because it's challenging. They might be experiencing more emotional issues, right? So, so it has to be that a monitoring approach and the tapering and the withdrawal approach might be slower than usual. So changes to how medications should be administered and monitored because of infection control reasons or some of the you know, appropriate alignment of those medication administration times 
in order to facilitate you know, social isolation and, and things like that. So there are a lot of good um, examples of how do we approach the medication management and the prescribing during the COVID-19 pandemic, in particularly in post-acute and long-term care settings. Next slide. And what you can do to reduce polypharmacy, nurses can you know, develop some quality improvement projects about the, you know, the use of medications, medication optimization project in the unit to monitor tracking the statistics of the prescribing. Talking about the prescribing with the patients and family member at least once a day. And that might seem, oh, that's very difficult. But as you develop that habit of talking about medications, every time that you, you provide medications to the patient, you just talk about how are you doing? How is the medications working? Is that working? If it's not, if it's not are there any alternatives that we should explore? So things like that. So talking about with the patients about the prescribing at least once a day, this can be achievable. And also looking at false reports, incident reports. If there are unusually amount of high amounts of risk of, um, of, of false, false incident report, there could be related to the medication side effects. And that's when the, the prescribing opportunity comes into play. So looking at those um, incident report, those risk reports, particularly, particularly focusing on the false, patient's false. And also download and the, the use of Empower brochures because um, the Empower brochures can be a, an excellent educational tool for the patient and also the prescribing algorithm that those are the algorithms that can provide you, you, provide you with a guideline of the step-by-step -step approach to the prescribing. So the next step, you can also look at some of the whiteboard videos that was developed by the prescribing network. And those are excellent um, you know, healthcare providers resources. And you can also subscribe to the Caden, the Canadian the prescribing networks newsletter. The newsletter comes out with lots of you know, um, educational resources, healthcare providers resources, and the latest evidence about the importance of the prescribing and medication management. And here are some other examples of resources that's available online, such as the Empower brochures and also some of the, the prescribing tools. And they're also uh, available on another website, which is the deprescribingnetwork.ca. I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Uh, Sun. Before we move on to the Q&A period, we'd like to ask participants to answer a couple of poll questions about today's webinar. So those should appear on your screen. We will now start the discussion portion of the webinar. If you haven't already, please type your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, use the prepared, we do, we do have some questions that came in beforehand, but I see we have nursing student questions here. And I think we have time just for one question. Um, this is coming from a nursing student. How often are, med uh, how often medications should be reviewed in long-term care homes or nursing homes? Is there a standard timeline? Uh, and the second part of that question, how can we effectively support patients with withdrawal symptoms when benzos, uh, benzodiazepines are discontinued? Those are excellent questions. And I answer the first question for, first. So in terms of uh, medication review, in long-term care homes, there are guidelines about at least, you do, you do it at least um, every 90 days. That is that as far as I know, this is the uh, protocol because of the um, MDS RI data sets that's required. That's part of the uh, medication reconciliation is part of the MDS RI data set um, at least every three, three months, so 90 days. Now, in a lot of the situation, if the patient is experiencing medications um, at first side effects, then that schedule will have to change. So that will prompt that the need for medication reconciliation and medication review with a group of healthcare providers as a team to decide if there are some medications that might be de de prescribed or changed. So 
I would say that on top of the, you know, the on admission, on discharge, and every three months, in between, as soon as there are any changes in the patient's situation, that would prompt the need for a medication review for the opportunity for the prescribe. And the second question you ask about the support for patients who are experiencing withdrawal symptoms, particularly from benzodiazepam. And, and this, this, this is a very good question in terms of the support. Patients who will have withdrawal symptoms from benzo, oftentimes they experience anxiety. And the anxiety could be, you know, could be very, very overwhelming that as a healthcare providers, we have to use other non-pharm non-pharmacological measures such as relaxation techniques. And we have to look at what actually works for the patients. So I talked about some cognitive behavioral therapy um, that we can refer them to and counseling services or any other, any other um, um, you know, um, therapy that the patients might, you know, might find useful. So the key is to really explore what are the non-pharmacological measures that the patient would find useful in order to overcome the withdrawal symptoms and not be going back to say, okay, um, you are experiencing withdrawal symptoms, so let's go back to the medication. We have to be very persistent because this process is it, tough, it's not easy. It's not an easy journey. So we need, first of all, for us ourselves as nurses, we, we need to be persistent and we need to be persistent with the patient in this journey. So the exploration of the appropriate use of non-farm measures is the key in this situation for support. Thank you so much, Dr. Sun. And thank you for this really thoughtful and insightful presentation. Um, for all of our participants, we really hope that this session stimulated your thinking about deprescribing. And you can access the recordings of our webinars by visiting CNA's YouTube channel as well. If you haven't already, please consider registering for the next webinar, System Transformation for an Indigenous from an Indigenous Perspective, which will be held on Thursday, February 26th from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Again, thank you so much for this uh, fantastic presentation, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.